Okay, so here I am back live, not really live, but modern for you guys for lecture five. Um, <clears throat> this is a lecture um, that's going to serve you well throughout your entire career. Probably the one that is going to help you the most um, for actual answers that are going to move you forward in your career. Um, you know, a, a lot of the math and the things we're going to go through are things you need to be aware of and understand, and accreditation makes you have to do them at least one or two times. Um, but they're not the things you're going to be repeating mathematically yourself throughout your career. Let's face it, you are going to have an engineer on, um, on your project. So most of these two courses are about having a firm base in what the engineer is doing and knowing when and what questions to ask and why decisions are being made. Because you guys, you guys wear all the hats. You guys have to know, it's, it, it baffles me what you guys have to know. It's so impressive. You have to know so much about all the different disciplines. This lecture is answers, this lecture will give you guys answers that you will be able to use for your entire career. So this lecture is the sizing guidelines. So if you remember in the very first lecture, I said that long before you have an engineer involved in the project, you guys often do a set of preliminary drawings. And those preliminary drawings often need to have at least a pretty darn good guess on what size beams you want in there. You don't care so much about the final actual uh, member, but what's really important to you guys is that you leave enough depth for what you're trying to do um, or how much floor space you're taking up with a column or a wall. Because that is going to be um, things that are going to help you proceed with the owner and make decisions on if a project is feasible or not. You know, I've used the example before and it's such a good one that if you are building on a site that has a hard limit on the upper bound of the top floor of your building um, and you say that you can have 10 stories uh, and your ceiling to ceiling height is so much and then it comes you come to find out in the final design when the engineer is doing the design that this isn't how much headroom you need for your beam this is how much you need but you multiply that extra little bit over 10 stories and you've added, you've put your building over the limit of its building height, which means now you can only have nine stories in your building. And that might be crucial for the building, for the, like the, the um, costing model for the owner that's building the building. It might not be a feasible building anymore. So these are really important decisions that you, as the architect, make very early in the project. So these are guidelines. We're going to talk about the sizing guidelines, we're going to talk about what they are, and then we're going to talk about how they apply to each material, and then I'll do a set of examples. You guys are going to repeat this in the assignment, for the most part, in your project that you do for me, for the part two project. You are going to use the sizing guidelines to estimate what members you'll need. In Structures too. You're going to go through this exercise several times as well. Um, you know, uh, the Structures Two group uh, just had their kind of desk crits meetings with the structural engineers yesterday, and to all of the visiting participating structural engineers, I shared with them my copy of my sizing guidelines because different engineers have their own. They're very close to each other, like small deviations. Um, some of it might be about local materials, things like that. Um, but uh, because in the, the desk crits, students will often say, well, how deep do I need to make that beam? And the answer is, how long is it? And what did your sizing guidelines say? Because often you can find, you know that information, you have it at your fingertips. Um, that's, it's easy to forget sometimes that you have access to that information. So if you hear me say that to you, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm trying to get you in the habit of, of thinking about it and knowing that, oh, right, I can go check my sizing guidelines and see what size member I should draw there for my preliminary drawings. And that's more or less what you're producing for me for structures too, is you're producing a set of uh, 
in Structures 2 in your comprehensive project, not this year, in Structures 2, you're going to be producing a set of preliminary structural drawings for your comprehensive studio project. Um, I did share them with you already, so they're up on the, the, the um, Quercus site. Um, they're in this week's module as well, just so that you have the lump right there. Um, and you might find them helpful for your studio project this term. Not that it's a comprehensive studio, but it's often nice to at least have an idea of the range of size that you need to be drawing in something, just to have a good feel for it. So these, these sizing guidelines are um, really just a rule of thumb or a rough estimate of a size. But most of the time, they're going to be pretty darn close to the final answer. Now, they're a broadly accurate principle or guideline based on experience or practice rather than theory. So, you know, we do this stuff enough and you start to see that in this range of normal, when you do out the final calculations, this size beam tends to be a good size beam. So they're guesstimates, if you want to call it that but very, very good guesstimates or a really close guess to the final design size. Remember, you wanna make sure that you're leaving enough depth. So if you think something seems a little bit odd, maybe you wanna leave yourself a little bit more room. So this will give you an approximate depth of a beam or the approximate dimensions of the column or wall that you need on your preliminary drawings. Now, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Everything you need to know about structures, you actually already know. You know it intuitively. I'm just putting some rigor to the things you instinctively already know. These rules are based on that gut feel that you have. Now, there's a tiny little bit of math involved with it, like a one line, plug it into your calculator kind of thing. So if you're looking at it and it seems too small, it probably is, and maybe you wanna think about why, have you made a mistake? Are you drawing something unreasonable? Or are you doing something with that member that makes it outside of the rules of ordinary or outside of the range of normal? So the way structural sizing guidelines work is we're saying that there's a linear relationship between depth and width. Now here's the thing. We are going to learn next term that that's complete crap. There is not a linear relationship between depth and length. It is in fact not linear at all. And in our final design, depth is either squared or cubed and length is either uh, squared or to the fourth. So <clears throat> they're not linear in our final design, but in the broad range of design, most things are in this small range of normal, and in that small range of normal, our sizing guidelines allow us to find that pretty close relationship as a linear relationship. So what we're saying is, if we know how long a beam is, we can divide it by our sizing guideline, and it'll tell us a pretty good estimate of how deep our beam needs to be. So just just so everyone is understanding length and depth. If we know how long this table needs to be, we take that length, divide it by a sizing guideline, and it's going to tell us how deep our table needs to be for preliminary sizing guidelines. Now, we do a final uh, design on that, but if you're trying to figure out if it's worth building this table, this is a pretty good exercise to go on. Now, we're not actually doing tables, but this is a good idea. So I've said that if something seems too small, you probably are right. Now, a table is normally meant for serving dinner on. Maybe you climb up on it to change the light bulb. That is your application of normal. Now, if you knew that this table was going to actually be supporting gold bullion or, um, you know, a new age supercomputer. Well, maybe you'd be like, huh, that's not what a normal table does. And it's only telling me it needs to be this deep, but we're doing something unusual with this table. 
that's a good indicator that your sizing guidelines might not apply. Or that maybe you want to say, my sizing guidelines said it needed to be this deep, I'm going to make it a little bit deeper. Everything we're going to be doing in this lecture and in your assignment and in the project I give you for part two of this term is in that range of normal. So we're not talking about the unusual things. Right now we want to talk about boring and normal. Next year, when you do structures two, you're going to be designing your comprehensive studio project. This is U of T. You're supposed to be pushing boundaries. You're supposed to be doing something incredible. We want to see your vision realized, or at least for your, comp for your studio project. For that, you will find that you have things that are not in the range of normal. Now, you don't know what to do past the range of normal, and in that sort of application, you would take your size and guidelines, take a look at it, and for me, you would say, hey, we know this is outside of the range of normal, we think we need to make it bigger, or you'd say, um, you know, here's how we're going to handle it, um, or you'd talk to your TAs or me, or you'd talk to your your your, um, your your director for your comprehensive studio project and come up with a plan around that. But the key for you is understanding when it's outside of normal, when something seems like maybe it's doing more than it's normally meant to do. So if we have this sizing guideline, um, we can, um, uh, if, so we know depth equals our length divided by our sizing guideline or a rule of thumb. And for a height of a column, we'd know the width or the minimum dimension on either side that we need. So W equals the height divided by the rule of thumb. Well, what if, what if we had um, a depth of beam and we didn't know what grid layout we wanted, but we knew that we had, um, we had that limited height problem and so we had to do our layout based on beams that were only this steep. Well, we could take that depth and multiply it by that size and guideline and say, okay, whew, now we know that our beams should be no longer than this, and maybe we should set our column spacing out that way so we can set up our grid now based on that information. Which one is the critical piece of information is going to change depending on the project. Um, you know, if you're building on an existing site and your grid's already set, well, your length is set for you. Um, I just gave an example where depth might be set for you. Or maybe it's irrelevant and you just want to know what beam to be designing in your preliminary drawings. So there's a few options on how you can make use of these sizing guidelines. So I've talked about some of this already. So when to use structural sizing guidelines? The rules of thumb will be close to the final designed member size when we are within the range of normal applications. This means that they might not apply if there's really high loads. I gave the example with the table. If the table is doing something more than a normal table is meant to do, well, maybe the size and guideline doesn't apply. If we're spanning really far distances, so things outside of the norm of our material, um, I shared with um, you guys and uh, shared it with Adrian the lecture Dave gave for the comprehensive class about what's normal with each material. You know, that's a thing that's, they don't really give me space to give that lecture in this course. But basically it's saying, hey, here are the limits of the size and guidelines. You don't have to watch that lecture, but a lot of people find it really nice. You're going to be hearing it next year in Structures 2 or a, a pretty close version of it that would be modified slightly for your particular comprehensive project. In the past, we've had theaters, we've had um, um, uh, community center, centers, um, subway stations, um, uh, all, a whole range of different things. And this year they're doing a, a cultural center for activism on a smaller site, slightly more stacked. So, you know, the, that lecture will be revised for you next term when you're in comprehensive studio, but there's always tidbits that might help you along the way. So feel free to go watch that lecture if you'd like. Uh, if you're using a unique layout or doing something unusual with how the members frame into each other, if you have large transfers, 
And so remember, a large transfer is if we have columns coming down, and then at this ground floor we want it open, so we drop that column that is picking up this story, this story, this story, this story, and the roof, and it stops right here on this beam. Well, that's a large transfer. You know, that beam just spanning that distance is doing something outside of the realm of normal because we've got a very large column coming down on it. So the sizing guidelines might not be sufficient. You might look at that and say, well, my sizing guideline tells me that needs to be a W410, but that load is huge. It's picking up one, two, three, four, five, six stories of load. Maybe we want to beef that up a little bit. Maybe we want to make it you know, uh, a W610 or something more than that. Um, and if you're doing something outside of what the material normally does, so if you're using it in a different way, um, you know, maybe you're doing shells or something unique with the material, these sizing guidelines might not apply for what you're doing anymore. They might, but it's good to know when you're looking at something outside of the usual application. And that's why those last two lectures I showed you were so important because that was just all usual stuff. That was the normal stuff we do with our materials. You know, there wasn't a lot of enlightened, exciting stuff in there, um, but it is the workhorse. It is the staple. It is how we build most buildings. And those are the things where these size and guidelines tend to apply. So let's take a look at some of these sizing guidelines. All of these calculations are very, very, very simple. So I'm not going to um, spend, I'm not gonna take the time to turn my camera down and write out calculations. I will try maybe to move my computer monitor so that if I need to, I can write on the screen. I was um, putting a piece of foam around a handle of something and I was trying to stretch foam out and I was put my fingers in and I was pulling out and we heard the most atrocious sound and I had torn my own finger out of its socket and damaged all the ligaments so I had to pop it back in. <sighs> um, so I'm still <clears throat> using a mouse is <laughs> a little bit difficult sometimes. Okay so the first sizing guideline we've talked about um, uh, deck and what it looks like and how it spans. So you can see here that these flutes span in the long way. So these, if you see an arrow on a plan saying the deck is running this way, it means that the deck is running like this. If you tried to pick this up, I wish I had a piece of cardboard like that sitting around. If you, I have, um, I have a piece of plastic roofing outside that I should pick up. Um, but even you could try it. Take a piece of paper and or a piece of cardboard and you can fold it into, actually, I'm going to do it right now. You guys should try this. Okay, so take a piece of paper and start to fold it into an accordion style thing. So you can see that I'm starting to fold it like that. So this is just to help you understand what spanning something in a particular direction means. You know, some of you are like, I get it. This is, why are you explaining this? Because this is one of those things that if you get it, you get it. And it's really easy to understand. But there are some people that even at the end of Structures 2 are struggling with this concept of what direction does this span. Um, so I just wanted to show you what I'm talking about. So. Here is my paper like this. If I hold it like this, you can see that it's nice and rigid. This is the direction that it's spanning. If I tried to do the same thing like this, it falls in. This is the weak axis of our deck. This is the strong axis of our deck. So if you try this with a piece of paper, you'll see what I'm talking about. And that is essentially what we're doing with this deck. We want 
this to be the direction that it spans. So if we say deck is spanning so far, we're talking about the distance between my fingers. That's how far this piece of deck or paper is spanning. So the size and guideline for corrugated metal deck is depth equals L divided by 50. Now, typically these are available in 38 millimeters or 76 millimeters deep, but 38 millimeters is the most common and the cheapest. We don't often use the 76. Um, it, it's, um, it's available. Um, it, is, it does not make your, chip, your system cheaper to span it further, um, but uh, uh, it is available. Maybe you need it aesthetically. Maybe you have something critical in a spot that needs to be there. Um, so it, it gives you options um, within your design, but if you have no other outside criteria, normal is 38 millimeter deck. That's what we try to stick with the most. So let's take a look. Um, so corrugated metal deck, depth equals length divided by 50. If we had joists at two meters center to center or 2000 millimeters center to center, what depth of deck should we use? Now what we're saying here is that we have joists or my fingers are two meters apart. Now imagine that this deck kept going and we had tons of deck. This sheet of deck is, you know, 10 meters long, but every two meters there's something holding it up or our joists. Now it might be joists, it might be purlins, um, and here we're talking about open web steel joists. I'm in fact going to change that to say open web steel joists. Slide six open web steel joists. I might even change it to say open web steel joists or purlins because I don't want you to get locked into your head that the only thing that can hold up corrugated metal deck is uh, open web steel joists. It can be joists or purlins. So they've told us it's two meters apart and our sizing guideline is 50. So 2000 divided by 50, hmm, 40 millimeters. Now, we don't normally like to pick a size lower than what our sizing guideline says um, because uh, that means we might not be picking a big enough member as a placeholder. But I'm going to tell you that two millimeters in this example is just fine. Um, I wouldn't go more than two millimeters off, um, but this is just ubiquitous that we often say that our metal deck can span two meters. So. L divided by L equals 2,000 millimeters or 2 meters. Our sizing guideline is 50. So D equals 2,000 divided by 50, 40 millimeters. We're going to suggest 38 metal deck. I went through in some of them and made the answers green just to pop out at you guys. Um, uh, but I didn't go back and do it to all of the slides, so I'm just writing a note to myself to just highlight, here's the answer. So if I gave you this as an exercise and you calculated 40 millimeters, that's great, but there's no answer there. That's an answer that lets you start to make a choice. The answer is 38 millimeter deck, because that's the thing you're going to draw on the drawings. That's what we're looking for here, is what are we putting on our drawings. You know, the calculation isn't enough, we want to know what we're doing with that calculation. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so if 38 millimeter DAC is pretty darn perfect for a two meter span, and 38 millimeter DAC is the most common DAC we use, and we like to make really good use of things, how often do most projects have elements supporting metal deck. Two meters. So in fact, if you wanted to take it 38 times 50, 1900. So 1900 to two meters, 1900 millimeters to 2000 millimeters is going to be the normal spacing for joists or purlins for metal deck. 
Let's look at concrete on metal deck now. Um, so our metal deck we'll often use on roofs. We might use it for a mezzanine or a light kind of um, uh, application. And we don't, we don't tend to like live loads on just metal deck. They put a piece of plywood over it so that they can put roofing on it. Um, but our metal deck is normally just for roofing loads. It's not always. Everything I say always has caveats to it. Um, but normally we use just plain metal deck for roofing, the, most of the time. Floors, we often use concrete on metal deck. Now, it's the exact same piece of metal they just punch little holes in the side of it, and then they put just some mesh on it, um, and that's just to help with crack control, and then they pour concrete on top of it. We've talked about this, we talked about this last week. Um, and so when they pour the concrete on it, these little dimples here kind of lock onto it and make it work as one thing. One of the last lectures of Structures 2, we talk about composite action, and that's where we don't just have two disparate materials, we take them and make them work together. And it's not as simple as you would think. We have to do things to make them work together. These little dimples in our normal metal deck are what make these two things work together. So, if 38 millimeter deck is our normal deck, going to be the same deck in our uh, concrete on metal deck and the most common assembly and industry standard is 64 millimeters of concrete on 38 middle millimeters of metal deck and normally our concrete is normal density so I'm going to draw you a little thing here um, and what we talk about this and I think I've probably already drawn this for you Now there's a funny lag when I'm drawing and recording. It's my, my computer is trying to do too many things because this is one monitor, this is the one it's screen capturing with the camera. So I'll try not to talk while I'm drawing. So there's our concrete on our metal deck. That dimension is our 38 millimeters. And the 64 millimeters is from the top of the top flute up to the top of the concrete. So the entire assembly is 102 millimeters. So you'll see us refer to, or you'll see people refer to, 64 concrete on 38 millimeter deck. We're talking about an assembly that is 102 millimeters. So if we have, you know, we have our deck spanning and now we've poured concrete all over it and our joists are still at two meters on center, What depth of concrete on metal deck should we use? Looking at our sizing guideline that says D equals L divided by 20. Well, we have two meters. Our sizing guideline is 20. D equals uh, 2,000 divided by 20 or 100 millimeters. That seems to be pretty great because we said the norm is 64 concrete on 38 millimeters of metal deck or a total of 102 millimeters. So this is the norm. This is what we use the most. So if 102 millimeters is the normal depth, the maximum span we'd ever really span that is, is our 102 times 20 or 2.04 meters. So whether it's metal deck or concrete on metal deck, the typical span is two meters. 
Now you're probably thinking, uh, but Shannon, the concrete on metal deck can obviously hold more load. Why does it have a lower sizing criteria? Well, there's two parts to it. Um, one is that we, and remember this isn't, these calculations aren't load based. These are determined to kind of standardize what we already know our design tends to be for these sorts of things. Well, if we're using metal deck, like I said, we're often just supporting roof. If we're using concrete on metal deck, we're often supporting live loads. When we're talking about live loads, they're often higher loads, and they also have the added complication that we're worried about vibration. And so um, if you go through the full design process, you will find again and again and again that the metal deck will come out to be two meters long, and the concrete on metal deck will come out to be about two meters long, or the span of it will be about two meters long. Because remember, it keeps going, but every two meters we have something supporting it. Um, so it's the fact that we're using it in its normal way that makes those sizing guidelines different for the two of them. So roof is the normal application for metal deck, and our sizing guideline is our uh, L divided by 50. Our concrete on metal deck is normally a floor where we have uh, higher loads and vibration considerations, so it's our length divided by 20. Open web steel joists. So now we had our deck that was picking up, being picked up by our joists. So let's say my fingers are the joists. What we're talking about now is how long are my fingers? Because remember, this was just a tiny little small thumbnail image of what we're talking about. Or we're talking about how long Sorry, there's something about when I'm doing that that it'll actually stop my camera from working if it does that funny little blip too much. I think it has something to do with my graphics card in my computer, which has always given me some funny problems. There's a there's some known problem with this computer where it, if I use the screen too much and too long, it actually gets all shaky and disrupted. Um, I'd had the problem, I searched forever for a, a solution, there was nothing, they were just like, yep, it's a problem. Um, I stopped looking for a while, um, and uh, mostly because I've been working from home like this, and when I finally looked again, two days after the last time I had looked, um, Microsoft had said, yep, no questions asked, you have this problem, return the computer, we'll send you a new one, um, but only for the next so long. And I was looking three days after that time frame had um, ended. So I had spent months looking for a solution. They finally, two days after I stopped looking, said there is no solution, we'll give you a new computer, and I missed the deadline. So now I'm looking at buying another $6,000 computer. So as soon as I can make that work, uh, hopefully maybe some of this will be better. Uh, okay. I had to restart here. Okay, so you can see here when we're talking about this, this is the length. How long is this joist? And here is the depth. We're talking about how deep this thing is. And remember, we have metal deck kind of sitting, coming in on the top of this, or concrete on metal deck. Or maybe there's some other system that's sitting on the top of this, but this gives you the idea of there's something kind of framing in along the top of this. So here's our open web steel joists. These are made by manufacturers. The final design isn't by me, the engineer, but I do need to have an idea of how deep it needs to be. Now, you're obviously gonna do a very preliminary design, I usually go a little bit further once I'm involved, where I actually look at the loads and I check their loading charts and see how far it spans. And then I put that on the actual contract documents, but they do the final design for it. So length divided by 16. 
So how deep do these open web steel joists need to be? If they're spanning nine meters. Well, 9,000 divided by 16, because that's our sizing guideline, gives 562.5 millimeters. Again, that's not the answer. That is the minimum depth we need. We don't want it to be shorter than that or shallower than that. If it's shallower than that, we might not leave enough space in our ceiling. Um, we can make it go deeper. And then if we find out as a bonus when we do the final design, it's just a little bit more shallow, that's great. No one's probably going to be upset to find out that you have a little bit more room than you needed. But it's a real pain to find out that you didn't have enough room for your structural assembly. So what do we do with this? In the last slide, I said that it normally comes in two inch increments or 50 millimeter increments. Now here's always where it's a pain in the butt. Knowing if you're talking about metric or imperial is kind of important. And in fact, they'll publish the same loading charts using metric or imperial information, um, but there's slight deviations. So for example, um, 16 inches, 16 times 25.4 is, let's see if we can see, is uh, uh, 406 millimeters. But you'll see a table that says they're 16 inch deep open web steel joists. But if you're looking at the metric one, they'll probably say 400 millimeter deep open web steel joists, even though there's a six millimeter difference there within that. So um, uh, if that six millimeters is crucial to your design, you'll need to know if they're talking about hard metric or imperial values. But that's usually a little bit later in the design. Um, so what I would want to see from you now, and we're going to be working in metric for our answers, unless I explicitly tell you otherwise, we're working in metric answers. And they normally come in 50 millimeter increments. We don't want to use something smaller than this because we might not leave enough headroom or enough depth in our ceiling height. So we'd say 600 millimeter deep open web steel joists. Now, remember, these are probably supporting concrete on metal deck or metal deck if they're at the roof. How often do you think we should have these open web steel joists? If we're drawing something in a preliminary drawing, how often would you want to put these? Well, both of those things can span about two meters. So we would want to say that we have a 38 millimeter metal deck or 64 concrete on 38 millimeter deck spanning to 600 millimeter deep open web steel joists at two meters on center. So every two meters, there's an open web steel joist picking up our deck. So those were two kind of products that we purchase um, that have come with design tables that we can look things up further on um, where they kind of tell us here's what's available. The rest of them, the rest of the steel elements come from the steel handbook the Handbook of Steel Construction. And within this, only, let's see, only, only this much of this gigantic book is actually the steel code. So the rules that tell us how to design in steel. Everything else is either interpreting how we design things in steel, or tables of things that we can design in steel, or the available products that we can have in steel. So for example, here's a table of a structural tee. We're gonna talk about that more again next term when we actually do our final design. But right now, it's enough for you to know that we tend to group these into categories. So we have our I-beams or our W sections, channels that look like a C, angles that we'll often represent with an L, around HSS, 
or a square or rectangular HSS. So you don't need to memorize this list, but you should be referencing it when I'm asking you these questions. If I say, how deep does a steel beam need to be? I am asking for W360 or W530. I am looking for information that tells me it's going to be around this depth. Now, these are not the final depths, but they're pretty darn close to this deep. You wouldn't want to give yourself a hard limit here, but give yourself a little bit of play in these dimensions. So, you know, like a W250 could be 230 millimeters deep all the way up to 275, I think, is the maximum depth for a 250. I know, it seems crazy. I'll talk a lot next term or next year about why they have this weird naming convention, but it's enough to know that what I'm looking for is what grouping or what group of steel sections. You're not going to know the rest of the information that goes with this. So I am not looking for W310 by 39 because that does not mean anything based on these sizing guidelines. That is things that we will figure out how to do next year. So if I am asking you for a depth, these are the things I'm looking for that are here on this page. Okay, remember when we talked about um, uh, our tributaries and our um, kind of experience of looking at a river. If you come across a river, it's a river. You don't know if it's a creek or a brook or a stream or a river. If we see a beam, it's a beam. If we're talking about it, it's a beam. If you're labeling it on your drawings, it's a beam. But when you're trying to figure out what sizing guideline to apply, it's helpful to know a small hierarchy of what these beams are doing. A purlin is a beam that is picking up deck or concrete on metal deck. It's the one that we have repeated again and again and again. So right off the bat, you know that purlins are probably the thing that is two meters on center. Beams are the bending element or the long element that's usually picking up purlins. So if I have the deck and my fingers are picking up the deck, if my fingers are the purlins, they're every two meters apart picking up the deck. But this isn't just floating in space here. My finger might be spanning to uh, the camera. Well, then the camera is our beam. I'm spanning to something and it's picking up all of these purlins that are two meters on center. A girder, a girder is the workhorse. A girder is the thing that is doing above and beyond the normal call of duty of a beam. If we look at our building that has that big transfer column in here, look at that. That is definitely going to be a girder because it is picking up that massive point load. That's not just picking up some purlins, which are picking up the deck. It is doing something extraordinary. And so that's when we use the sizing guidelines of a girder. And the reason is the purlins are going to give us the most shallow thing because they're doing the easiest job. Beams are going to give the sizing guidelines are going to give us a mid range depth, which is pretty normal. And a girder sizing guideline is going to give us a deeper criteria because we want to make sure we leave room for the fact that it is doing extra work in some way. I've seen people in the past identify uh, a bending member as a girder, size it as a girder and say, that's too deep. I'm going to use the beam sizing guidelines. That's not how it works. If it's doing the job of a girder, it's a girder. You can't just pick that you'll make it a beam. If you want to pick to make it a beam, you have to get rid of those things that made it a girder. You would have to put, if you didn't want this to be as deep as it needed to be, well then you'd have to put a column in there to get rid of that criteria that was making it a girder. So this is where it's important for you to stop and look at what's being asked. If you see something about two meters on center, it's probably a purlin. If you see something about spanning column to column, well, that means it's probably a beam because it's the thing picking up the purlins. 
If you see the term transfer or um, long span or extra loads, we're probably talking about a girder because it's doing a job above and beyond a normal beam. Okay, beam widths. I don't care about beam widths at all. These are just something to help you draw something in your preliminary drawing. So it looks somewhat pleasing to the eye, but the actual width is going to come out of the final design. So if you want to say it, the beam width sizing guidelines are bullshit. Sorry to swear, but I just really want to lock that into your brain. They are horse poop. They are not very good sizing guidelines. They are just something to help you draw what looks good. So, beam width. Depth divided by two to depth divided by three could be used to draw something, but it's very inaccurate and only a very, very rough image based on guidelines. So put no stock into that width. We're gonna talk about a few things where it might be helpful to know width later on. Sorry. It's very dry in here. Um, uh, but I'll identify that as we go. So how deep do Perlin's beams and girders need to be if they spanned 8.5 meters? So if we had my fingers supporting the deck and my fingers were 8.5 meters long, how deep do they need to be? If the thing my fingers were spanning to was also 8.5 meters long, how deep does it need to be? And if that member also had a big transfer coming down on it, how deep would it need to be? So for a purlin, it would be uh, 8,500 divided by 25 or 360. If we go back to that list of available, seam, um, available members, a C380 or a W360. Now, I'm usually going to be looking for a W section if we're talking about um, I beams or W beams for things. Um, the one place we might use um, a channel is as a purlin. We wouldn't usually use it as a beam or a girder, um, but we might use them as a purlin. Um, if our beam was 8.5 meters long, we'd have 8,500 divided by 20 or 425 millimeters. 425 millimeters is not the answer. W460 is an answer I'm looking for. A girder, if our girder is 8.5 meters long, well our 8,500 divided by 15 is 567 millimeters, or a W610 beam would be a good thing to start drawing in on your drawings. If those purlins are suppo supporting 38 millimeter deck or 64 concrete on 38 millimeters deck, how often should they occur? Well, we know that that deck can span about two meters. So we'd want um, a C380 or a W360 at two meters center to center because our, that's how far our deck can span. So look, we're already populating drawings. We have like the, Deck is one of the cheapest things in your project, but you have the most of it, so it ends up being a pretty big ticket item. Um, and if it's a pretty big ticket item, and I've already told you that the most common is 38 metal deck or 64 concrete on 38 metal deck, great. You already know how to represent that on a drawing and what it looks like. It spans about two meters. And then if you know how long the member is that's picking it up, and that's the next most prolific thing on your project. Well, now you know how to put something representative on that. You could even do a pretty good costing set out of this preliminary design set or this very preliminary drawing package that you could produce. Okay, trusses. Trusses are basically big open web steel joists but open web steel joists are standardized and have tables that we can look things up. A truss is a custom made element that is specific to that project and it's a hell of a lot more expensive than an open web steel joist. We use these usually when our girder in the available size beams 
there is no available size beams. So say we had a long girder member here and we sized it and it was 1500 deep. Well, we didn't have any W sections that deep. We're gonna start talking about making it a truss. Maybe we do a WWF section, a wide welded flange section, um, or maybe we make it a custom truss. Now, custom trusses are deeper than a girder. So you're gonna think, why would I go out of my way to make a deeper member? Here's the thing. They have a lot less material in them. So material wise, you've taken out a huge portion of the material, but you've added in fabrication. And I've talked before about how labor is very expensive in our market and material is kind of cheap. So again, now you're still saying, again, why would I make a truss? Well, often if the only comparable is a girder, um, that we don't have available members, maybe a truss is your only option. Maybe you can make use of that depth in other ways. Um, maybe uh, the cost of making your own girder as a built up plate section is too expensive because there's still fabrication cost in that. So trusses can be very handy. Now, for example, the gold ring project, which I uploaded some drawings just for you to peruse. There's nothing you have to do with them, but they're just things that you can look at so that you can say, oh, here's what structural drawings look like. In that project, we had floor to floor trusses. So the top cord, which is the member up here, top cord, web elements, bottom cord, the top cord, was at the roof level. The bottom cord was the floor of the fourth floor. So these also were little bending elements within this truss. Doorways and hallways went right here. So you can make these trusses very deep when you have the opportunity. Um, the front and back trusses on Goldring were four stories deep. They went from the roof all the way down to just shy of the ground. They couldn't sit on the ground because there was nothing underneath it because the basketball court was actually bigger than it. It was a, an illusion that it was sitting on the ground. Now these are made by manufacturers and can be custom. By that logic, you could make them whatever depth you wanted, but we still tend to, on our drawings, make them at 50 millimeter increments. So that's what I'm gonna be looking to see on any um, elements I give you. But if you were in a jam and you needed it at a very custom depth, you can do it with trusses because they're custom anyway. All right, so what tri size truss do we need if we're spanning that 8.5 meters? It's a little bit weird to make a truss that's only 8.5 meters long, but we do it sometimes. Well, we would get a custom truss that we would probably make 700 millimeters deep. Again, we could make it exactly 666 millimeters deep, um, but we would often indicate it in two uh, inch increments. Columns. So the column sizing guidelines um, bug me just a little bit um, because you really have to be aware of the application that you're talking about. For short columns, stick to H divided by 20, which is what we're going to be talking about here. Unless I say something explicitly, we're going to be talking about columns that are relatively short. So standard sizes listed in the same handbook um, stocky W sections and HSSs would be the most common. So we wouldn't use angles for anything and we wouldn't use channels for anything for this section. So if our column is three meters tall, what dimension should we make it? Well, our sizing guideline is our width or our dimension is our height divided by 20. So three meters divided by 20 is 150. That's the minimum dimension of the smallest size. It can be bigger. We have no problem with that. But we want to draw something that is 150 millimeters 
big no matter what. So maybe we'd use a W150 or an HSS 152 by 152 or a round HSS 152 diameter section. So let's take a look at this little chart here. So <coughs> assuming our datum is 3.2 meters, so that means just in case anyone doesn't know, when I say datum, I'm talking about here to here. So we're saying that this story height is 3.2 meters tall. Don't worry about subtracting, you know, the metal deck thickness or anything like that. And remember, our steel tends to be just up underneath the underside of the metal deck. Um, so this is roughly how tall our columns would be, for example. Size the concrete on metal deck, the joists, the purlins, the beam, and girder, and provide a truss alternate, and also the columns for the following. Well, look. When we see a dashed line like this, we're talking about a joist. So, oh look, they even labeled it, 2J01. We have deck, look at this arrow, spanning like this here, 2D01. So, deck of some sort. They've told us that the deck is concrete on metal deck, so this is probably a floor. Two probably means level two. You can infer a lot about this one little drawing just by knowing what standard um, ways to name, name things. You don't have to call this two. If you if your level two in your building is the um, uh, the the green room, maybe it. Well, G is also used for ground very often. Maybe it's the um, uh, orange room or the orange floor. Maybe you have O here. O J O one. O D O one. Um, there's usually some kind of um, relevant way that you're calling these something. So we have, it looks like they switched from joists to beams here. So we have 2B01. Well, look, doesn't it look like there's a lot of these beams picking up the deck, kind of doing the same job, basically doing the same job my fingers were? Well, that means these are probably purlins here. It looks like we switched from open web steel joists to purlins here. And then there's 2B02, and it looks like there's two of them. They're picking up joists or purlins. What type of sizing guideline did we say applies if it is a bending member or a beam that is picking up joists or purlins? Yeah, that's the beam sizing guideline. So these ones would probably use the beam sizing guideline. And then look, we have 2B03. It's a really long span, and look at this, CA, column above. So this column doesn't keep going below this beam. This column stops on this beam. So there's load coming from floors above, coming down and hitting this beam. So even though this beam is doing the job of picking up open web steel joists and purlins, it looks like it's doing a bigger job than that. So I would think I would call this one a girder. It's doing an extra big job. And we know that if a girder doesn't work, maybe we'd want to look at a truss alternative, which seems to be what they've been telling us in this one line sentence right here. So it looks like we want to size 2D01, 2J01, 2B01, 2B02, 2B03, and our columns C1, to C3. So 2J01 and 2B01, how long are they? If we look here, they start here and they finish here. Oh look, eight meters. We've got a length for our joists and we've got a length for our purlins. How far does the deck span? Well, it's being picked up. Remember, this is our deck. What we care about is how far apart are the things that are supporting it. And the deck is sitting on these joists and purlins. So how far apart are these joists and purlins? Well, this whole length is 24 
meters long. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen spaces. So twenty-four, twenty-four divided by our thirteen spaces, we've got one point eight four six meters. So it looks like we've got open web steel joists or purlins at 1,846 millimeters center to center. So deck, assume concrete on metal deck and that it's a floor, which seems reasonable because there was a column above going somewhere. So we know there's something happening about this building. It means it's not a roof. It was also labeled two something, which usually means level two. So there's a pretty good assumption here that it was a floor. Well, we know that our length was 24 meters and there was 13 spaces and we just plugged it in that we had 1.846 millimeters or meters long or that it spanned uh, uh, 1.846 meters. Sizing guideline for deck is your length divided by 20 or 1,846 divided by 20 gives us 92.3 millimeters. Again, that's not the answer. We know that normal is 38 deck divided by 64 concrete. It looks like we could have a bigger spacing. Maybe we could have only 12 spaces. Let's see what that would give us. 24, 24 divided by 12. Oh, two meters. Maybe we could have gotten rid of an entire joist or purlin, or maybe we know something about this project. That maybe the loads are a little bit heavier than normal. We don't know, but we do know that they have already drawn this and we're putting some preliminary sizes to it. It doesn't seem that out of whack that it's around, it's just a little bit less than two meters on center for our spacing. So, you know, we're, we're, we might say, you know what, you have the opportunity to possibly get rid of uh, a joist or a purl in here, um, but here's your feedback. So, you know, that's the kind of thing, sorry, it's a little bit cold, little, that's the kind of feedback we would give. The joist. We saw that the joists were two meter, or eight meters long. We know our joist sizing guideline is 16, so 8,000 divided by 16 is 500 millimeters. Handily enough, we like to draw our open web, or talk about our open web steel joists in 50 millimeter increments. So 500 open web steel joists at 1.846 millimeters center to center. What we often do is say two meters on center max, or we might put the specific spacing. It really depends on the project or what we're going for. Perlin, 2B01. So we're saying, you know, level two beam one. Now, it's still a beam, it's a beam, but we're using the Perlin sizing guideline because it is the thing picking up the deck. It is around every two meters on center doing a pretty low key job. It's certainly not working the hardest a steel member can work. So we're gonna use the Perlin sizing guideline. 8,000 divided by 25 gives us 320 or a W360. Maybe we use a C380 or a W360. So I don't know why in this project they switched from open web steel joists to a W section, but you can imagine on one side of the building, they have a deeper soffit than on the other side. So maybe it has to do with mechanical, or maybe there was clearance issues. Maybe there's something happening in that room that's not happening in the other, that they needed that tighter ceiling height. So we don't know what the drive was on this, but whoever drew it knows that open web steel joists are a little bit bigger than purlins, and they probably put that into thought when they drew it out. And so they switched to purlins because they needed a shallower depth there. So for the same span, the purlins are shallower, but they're heavier. They're probably more expensive than the open web steel joists. So there had to be a good reason to do that. We don't know what it was. 
Nobody's told us what that is, but we know that someone somewhere had a good reason for that. So beam 2B02, we saw that that was spanning 12 meters, so it was a 12 meter long beam. Sorry, heel is itchy. Um, so it's a 12 meter long beam, and we call them all beams. So what sizing guideline do we use? Well, there were purlins and open web steel joists spanning and being picked up by 2B02. But there didn't seem to be anything else extraordinary happening to 2B02. There was no transfers. There was nothing to give us an indication that there were extraordinary loads on this because everything else looks relatively normal. So if we use the Perlin sizing guideline, we'd end up, we'd end up drawing something too shallow. And we could be unpleasantly surprised when we did the final design and found out we needed more headroom. So we should use the appropriate sizing guideline for what it's doing, which is beam. So its length was 12 meters. The sizing guideline for a steel beam is 20. So 1200 or 12,000 divided by 20 is 600 millimeters. A good beam to be drawing is a W610 in that location. Now the girder, 2B03, we saw that it was picking up a big column point load right at the middle of it. So it's a long member and it's picking up a point load on it. So we know that the, the, even the girder sizing guidelines might be pushing it here a little bit. So sizing guidelines is 15 for a girder or 24,000 divided by 15 is 1,600. There was nothing available in those standard steel available sizes that I showed you. The biggest one was a W1100. So we have two options here. We can make our own steel beam, and those often look like that. but they get welded up there. So there's intense design with these. They're not, um, a norm, they're not as normal as trusses. So maybe we'd make that 1600 deep wide welded flange. Now, I didn't even show you those in these charts um, we're, we'll talk about these next term, but this is a thing we can do. We can make a steel beam, but they're expensive. It uses a lot of steel. The cheaper option, if a normal steel beam isn't available, is often to make a truss. So let's take a look at what the truss would need to be. It's the same length, and the sizing guideline is 12. It ends up being deeper. So um, we have uh, 24,000 divided by 12 gives us 2,000. So a custom deep truss that's two meters deep. Now here's the thing. Our truss is now, our, our floor to floor height was 3.2 meters. So that only leaves 1.2 meters. I'm taller than one think I'm taller than 1.2 meters. I'm taller than 1.2 meters. That's four feet tall. So anyone would bonk their head on the bottom of that truss if you need to walk through there. Now, maybe it's the perimeter of the building. Maybe it's the edge of a corridor. Maybe what you'd want to do is, even though we know it only needs to be two meters deep, maybe we make it 3.2 meters deep and have it be floor to floor height like i mentioned in the gold ring project and then you put doors through if you need to so context is really really important when you're trying to pick how to make your truss work now again remember they're custom no matter what so there's a premium but there's a big premium with this beam as well and again if we had that 3.2 meter story to story height and we were putting in a 1600 deep beam, we're still only left with 1.6 meters there. So we still have some headroom issues if that's trying to connect to another part of the building. 
Um, it looked like in that context it was the edge of the building, but maybe that was just a partial plan they gave us. We're not quite sure. So these are the things that you can think about. I'll try to be very explicit about what I'm asking from you in any assignments and on the project. But a lot of this isn't just about you passing the course. It's about trying to give you useful knowledge that you can use throughout your career. But if it was just about sharing information with you, I would give it to you happily and we'd all walk away. But we have to test you on something or find some um, metric to be able to provide a mark on this. Um, and doing a little bit of math for it is the easiest way. And it's what's mandated for us to go through this. So now let's take a look at the columns. Let's talk about column C1. We know the story to story height was 3.2 meters. That's a, shot, that's a short column. I said all the ones we're going to be talking about are going to be short columns. So 3.2 meters or 3200 divided by 20 is 160. So an HSS 203 by 203 seems like a good thing to draw on our drawings. We wouldn't want to draw 152 by 152 because we might be surprised later to find out that we needed a bigger column. Now let's take a look at column CO2. It's the same. What could your gut tell you about CO1 versus CO2? Let's just go back, way back, and look at CO1 <clears throat> versus CO2. Which one do you think is picking up more load? Look at this. The tributary area for CO1 is this. The tributary area, actually, I can draw this. The tributary area for CA1 is that. Well, that's not what I'm trying to do. The tributary area for CO2 is twice as much. We know that the actual design is dependent on the load, so the sizing guidelines for columns don't seem very good here, do they? Because we've doubled the amount of load on CO2, but the sizing guidelines are the exact same. Let's talk about CO3 for a second. So CO3 is picking up half of the span of 2BO3, but it's also picking up half of the load from this column above. What if this column above is a big, long, tall building? Now, here's another thought. So we can see that, you know, it's not that great here for trying to pick these out. Think about this, too. If we had every story on this building was the exact same height, this column here, which is just picking up one corner of one story, would be a 203 by 203. Down here, this column would still be, by our preliminary sizing guidelines, a 203 by 203. But it's picking up one, two, three, four, five, six times the amount of load that the one at the roof was. So having an understanding of what your column is doing is very, very, very important. If it is at the bottom of a 100-story building, you're probably going to want a bigger column than a 102 by, or a, than a 203 by 203. Can I tell you what that is? No, because these are just sizing guidelines. Maybe, maybe make it, you know, uh, 600 by 600. I, we don't know we would want to look at the actual loading for that. And if you were in your project, in Structures 2 and Comprehensive, designing a 100-story building and you did your sizing guidelines and got 203 by 203, 
I would hope that you would intuitively understand that that's probably not enough. And you would make a little note saying, hey, I did the sizing guidelines, but I know that this is not enough. We'd be looking at something much larger here. All right, let's talk about wood now. So that was all of our steel sizing guidelines. I like to talk about that one because it's a little bit, um, I like to do the steel first because it's pretty basic. Wood, um, the width becomes a little bit more important, but I'm gonna try to make it as easy for you to get the right answer on anything on the assignment as possible. So I'll explain that when I get to it in a minute. Wood is a pain in the butt because it is dimensional or nominal lumber. When we say two by six, two by six, we're talking about something that's actually only one and a half inches by five and a half inches. It is not two inches by six inches. It was when it was rough sawn and then it gets planed down a little bit. And we end up with losing a quarter an inch, quarter of an inch on each side of a two by four and a two by six. On two by eights to two by twelves, we actually lose more than that on the depth. Look, seven and a quarter, nine and a quarter, 11 and a quarter is what we're left with. So if you're talking about a two by 12, you're talking about a one and a half by 11 and a quarter. Remember, 25.4 is the multiplier to switch from inches to metric. You have that in slide one. Um, we've plugged that into calculators a few times now. So we will be switching because ubiquitously, we talk about um, wood construction, even on a metric project, as a two by four, two by six, two by eight, two by 10, two by 12, or a four by four. We just still talk about them that way, even if it's a metric project, often. Now we use this type of lumber uh, in residential construction. We're not talking about mass timber here. We're talking about residential construction or the smaller scale wood construction. And this lumber gets used for joists. So the thing spanning, picking up our deck, uh, we use it for studs. Studs are in our walls. So think of columns that we have repeated very close together. So they're picking up gravity load, but we have them repeated again and again. Beams, where we might have a big element, but beams we often will take a few of these and screw them together. We'll use at least two plies in a beam condition, and we'll screw them together to make multiple plies of this. Posts, we'll often use at least a four by four, or we'll screw together multiple plies of two by material. You can get full size lumber. It's hard to find. Um, you usually go right to the mill. So um, at my cottage, uh, I was building a dock and I sourced from the mill itself, full size lumber. It's not as smooth. It can be a little bit rougher. It's got some, the edges are a little bit sharper, um, prone to splinters just a little bit more. But for something very utilitarian, it can be quite useful. Um, but if you're going into Home Depot, you are buying nominal lumber. And that's what we're going to be talking about now. Plywood. Plywood does the job of our concrete on metal deck or our metal deck. So it is the thing that is spanning from joist to joist. It comes in four by eight sheets, but it's not spanning four feet or eight feet. It is spanning a distance much smaller. The smallest thicknesses usually get used for subfloors. Um, Floors and walls, we tend to use a half inch or three quarters of an inch in our design. Eye joists, the depth is usually sized by the engineer. The actual member design is by the supplier. We would use these to trade out joists. And you can think about these as the equivalent of beams or um, purlins to open web steel joists. Our normal wood joists are our two by material that are ubiquitous, similar to our purlins. Uh, our open web steel joists are fabricated and designed by the supplier and can do a little bit more with a little less material. 
and that's what eye joists are. These are custom made by a manufacturer and available in a range of sizes. I feel like I have some of my notes missing on that one. So on slide 27, eye joist depth. It's in, it's further in here, but it might as well be on both slides. We can get engineered lumber as well. Now, this can be pushing into the mass timber range, but mass timber, we're usually talking about glue lamb. What I'm talking about right now is members that when our normal wood just won't do it. So we're, we just can't make our nominal lumber do the job we need it to do. It's not available. It can't be that long. It's not available in that depth. We might introduce engineered lumber. And so that's our PSL or our LVL, parallel strand lumber or laminated veneer lumber. So parallel strand lumber, it literally looks like you took a bunch of apple peels and stretched them out as close as you could and then filled it all up with glue. Laminated veneer lumber looks more like um, a series of, um, uh, of beams. They look more like um, you've taken thin sections of, uh, of, of wood and glued them together. Kind of like a beam version of plywood, but plywood can also be sort of like CLT. So it's basically we've oriented all the strands in the strong direction. Now, these would be designed by the engineer, um, but their avail availability changes depending on where you are and who the contractor is and what sizes are available. So I've put a common range of widths and depths here. Um, the depths are so that you can answer questions in the assignment, um, but some of the other information is just for yourself so that you have access to kind of what's available out there in the market. because. Nobody really tells you these things. Glue lamb or glue laminated timber, we're not going to go into too much in this lecture, but we are going to touch on it. So this could be moving into the realm of mass timber. We can still use it with our other lumber as well. We might, we would use it for beams. We can use it for posts. You can curve it. It's not a replacement for regular lumber. It's usually being used in a grander scale than that. Um, you can maybe use it in conjunction with regular lumber, but this would be to replace steel, for example. CLT, or cross-laminated timber, is really taking nominal lumber and gluing it together like plywood. So the top sheets of it span that way, the next sheet spans that way, that way, and you can build it up to seven levels thick. Um, three to five tends to be normal. And you can see here, that's uh, either a two by four or a two by six, and a series of them glued together. This would replace plywood on joists if it is your uh, floor or roof. And if it's your wall, it's replacing your plywood and your studs. It comes in sheets two feet to 10 feet wide. It can come up to 60 feet long, but it can't span that far. So you'd need other supports for it. And you can get it up to 20 inches thick. All right, so that's the available lumber. Let's talk about sizing guidelines now. So here are the things that we need to know. Let's talk about the sizing guidelines. So plywood typically spans 16 inches center to center. I'm just giving you that. We're not even going to do a sizing guideline. It is so much dependent on load if you're going outside of 16 inches on center. But if things are in the realm of normal, your joists or your studs are going to be at 16 inches on center. That is standard. That is what the industry does. If you buy insulation, you buy it to fit within that those studs. Um, so they take off um, an inch and a half of the width and you can put that piece of insulation in like that. Tape measures are set up to mark things out at 16 inches on center. If you're using, I have one right here. I've always got a tape measure on hand. 
If you are using an imperial tape measure, which is the way most of them work, you can see that the red one is 16, and let's keep going to 32. That was my water glass. It did not tip over, and I do not know how. Uh, you can see that 32, so 16 plus 16 is 32, is the next red one. And that is to make it easy to mark things out at 16 inches on center without having to think about it. So you can have at 12, I have a project right now where I have my, my joists at picking up um, my uh, deck at 8 inches on center because we have such heavy loads, but that is not the norm. It is something outside of the realm of normal. So plywood spans 16 inches on center unless you're doing something unusual, and so that means your studs and your joists are going to be at 16 inches on center. Tongue and groove deck, we don't use as often anymore, but it is available in the world. It's typically available in 38, 64, or 89 millimeter depths. Similar to metal deck, 38 millimeters is the most common and the cheapest. Here's what I find interesting. Back in the day, metal deck didn't exist. It wasn't that common. I mean, it didn't exist and then it wasn't that common. We had tongue and groove deck which was milled to 38 millimeters, which is our inch and a half of our two by material. When metal deck came out on the market, they were like, hey, we want you to use our product instead. And so what we've done is we've made it match the depth of your wood element so that you can just replace wood on your project and put in our metal deck. You're not gonna have to change your datums. You're not gonna have to do anything. So it was a really smart marketing campaign on how they developed that material. Now it seems weird. It's so disparate. Why would you have made it 38 millimeters? Why not 40 millimeters? It seems like a funny thing. Well, it was because it was made to be the replacement for tongue and groove deck. And we're gonna see the sizing guideline for tongue and groove deck is L divided by 40. So if the purlins are at 1600 center to center, what depth the deck would we use? Well, 1600 divided by 40 gives us 40 millimeters. Again, I said two millimeters. I'll accept two millimeters off. Uh, the 38 millimeters uh, is gonna be fine for tongue and groove wood deck. So 38 millimeter tongue and groove deck spanning um, 1.6 meters max. Now, this looked like the maximum we'd ever let tongue and groove span, and it spans about 1.6 meters. Our metal deck spans 2 meters for the same depth. So that was their other big marketing campaign. They were like, hey, you can get rid of a bunch of stuff that you're supporting things with. Joists. Now, joists are normally picking up our plywood not tongue and groove. If you are picking up tongue and groove, you're talking about beams now because those are spanning that 1.6 meters. When we're talking about joists in wood, we're talking about the thing that is every 16 inches on center. And our size and guideline is L divided by 16. Now remember, our, uh, our lumber comes in uh, two by four, two by six, two by eight, two by 10, two by 12. So if we know that that really means three and a half, five and a half, seven and a quarter, nine and a quarter, or 11 and a quarter, make that metric. Here are the different sizes you have. 38 millimeters wide or 89 millimeters wide, but 38 is what's common. By 89, by 140, by 184, by 235, or 286 deep. And if they're supporting plywood, they should occur every 16 inches center to center. So how deep should our joists be if they're spanning 2.75 meters or 2,750 millimeters? Our sizing guideline is L divided by 16. So we get 127 millimeters deep. Joists or lumber we have a 38 by 184. We wouldn't want to go down to our 140, which would be our two by six. We want a 38 by 184 so that we make sure we've left enough room when we do the final design. 
so a 2 by 8 is what we're calling up. If they're supporting plywood, they should occur every 16 inches. So we would put, if we're doing an imperial project, we'd put a 2 by 8 at 16 inches on center. Or we might write 38 by 184 at 400 millimeters center to center. Engineer joists, remember, these are designed by the supplier. Um, and our sizing guideline is just a little bit better than our joists. So an engineered product at the depth varies. Here are some common depths that are available. So how deep should some eye joists be if they're spanning seven meters? Our sizing guideline is L divided by 18. So 7,000 divided by 18, we get 389 millimeters. We want to make sure we leave enough ceiling space to fit everything for the final design. So we want to make sure we pick a size that's equal or bigger than what the minimum we need is. So the closest is a 406 millimeter. So these eye joists would be 406 engineered eye joists. And if they're supporting a typical plywood floor, we would want them at 16 inches center to center, or a 406 engineered joist at 400 millimeters center to center. So wood sizing guidelines now. Beams in wood tend to be, um, uh, usually we're doing things that are pre relatively basic with wood. That's kind of how we build our framing out. A lot of it's based on part nine, which isn't the code we're following, but part nine does exist in the building code, which is basically, it's an entire code built on sizing guidelines. That's what you can think of part nine of the building code as being, but we're learning to design things. Right now we're touching on some of those sizing guidelines. So it's really the only part where we'd be looking at what might be used in part nine. So lumber beams would be our typical application. Um, if we're coming out of that range, we'd probably be switching to engineered girders. Um, we can use engineered beams as well. So our lumber beams are the things that are picking up our open web steel joists. So we have our lumber beams are picking up our joists or our engineered joists. So the thing that is at 16 inches on center frames into something, something picks that up or supports it. That would be our lumber beams. If we can't get lumber beams to work, maybe we need to look at using engineered lumber instead. So that would be our PSL or our LVL. If that beam is doing a job above and beyond, which is less common in wood, for the scale of construction we're talking about with these sizing guidelines, which is in the range of residential construction, we tend not to have that many girders, but you might have a girder. And if you have a girder, you're probably gonna be doing engineered wood with that girder. Beam width. We're gonna use a very loose rule of D divided by two to D divided by three. This is important because our beams, if we're doing built up materials, are going to be so many plies. And this is going to help us pick how many plies of wood we want to draw on our preliminary set. Again, we're accepting that it would be um, uh, final engineers, engineering is going to govern it all. So these are our preliminary sizing guidelines that we're talking about. Um, so we will think about that when we do our uh, lumber beams here in a minute. So lumber beams are built up from two to four plies of standard lumber sizes. You could even go up to five. I have a project right now where I'm doing five. It's a little bit hard because you can't fit it in walls, so it's not great if it's in your ceiling sometimes. Um, but I have a project where it's uh, a raised up floor and it's all being hidden and there's no walls I have to try to fit these in. So five ply works just fine there. Uh, columns can be built up or they can be solid standard sizes like a four by four post or two 
two by fours to make one solid post. Engineered beams and girders are glued and or laminated wood products like our LVL, our PSL, or our glue in. So let's do an example with a plan the same way we did with our steel one. So it looks pretty similar. Um, we have different dimensions um, and I've given us a few different bits of information here. So the question asks, assuming the datum is 2.438 millimeters floor to floor, what should be on the preliminary drawings for the plywood deck? 2J01 as joists, 2J02 as eye joists, beams 2B01 to 2B03, and the columns C01 to C05. Pay attention to the columns above on 2B03. So look at this. 2B03 has a column above here. This span seems to be 5.33 meters. This span seems to be 10.67 meters. On this side, each one of these spans is 4 meters. And this span, or this dimension, is 4 meters. They've told us our deck spans like this. We know right away that picking up that deck, that deck is going to be plywood. They've already told us it's plywood, which means we need something at 16 inches center to center. And look to our relief, 2J01, they did say at 16 inches center to center, and 2J02, they did say that it's at 16 inches center to center. So there's something picking up that plywood every 16 inches. Just in case there's somebody that doesn't understand what I'm talking about there. This is our plywood, and here are our joists, or maybe they're the engineered eye joists. I was just drawing them for demonstration. Center to center of each of those is 16 inches. And that's what they've told us they're actually drawing here. So deck, 2D01 plywood deck. Well, we know floors are typically 3 quarters inch or 19 millimeters plywood with supports at 16 inches center to center. Great. So our deck is going to be, for our preliminary drawing set, 3 quarter inch plywood uh, with supports at 16 inches center to center. Step one done. Joists, 2J01. So these joists here are spanning from this line to this line, are four or four meters. We know that our sizing guideline for wood joists is uh, 16. So our 4,000 divided by 16 gives us 250 millimeters. And we know that a 2 by 12 is going to be a really good choice for our uh, half, 1 half inch by uh, 11 and 1 quarter inches is going to be great. And we call that a 2 by 12 choice at 16 inches on center to center. So I'm actually even going to add that on there. Two I joist, I joist two J O two, same span. It was spanning the same distance, um, but the sizing guideline is length divided by eighteen, or two hundred and twenty-two millimeters. We know that there's a range of I joists available, and the two forty I joist seems like it's going to be a really good choice. Now, two by twelves are cheaper than I joists. The I joists are a custom manufactured thing. So why wouldn't we just make it all 2 by 12s We don't know what the requirement was there. So maybe there's a headroom issue and that 1 and 3 quarter inches is critical. Maybe they're dropping the floor in that zone because they're putting a concrete topping. We don't know what, the, what, the, um, what governed that choice or what drove that choice. We just know that it was probably very critical. Um, we would be more than, we would be good engineers if we said, hey, 
Um, I'm assuming you have really good reason. My instinct would have been just to do 2x12s all the way across the floor, rather than switch at this line right here to engineer joists. Why did you do it? Do you have a reason? Because you know that people make choices for a reason, but it's hard to see that in that drawing. So um, giving, giving good feedback can be a really important thing, but understanding that your feedback is not a rule. It's not me saying, don't use eye joists, use the 2x12s, is not what I'm trying to do there. I'm trying to give feedback to let you know that there's a cheaper option, but maybe you have a really good reason for doing this slightly more expensive option. So 2B01. So that, we want to start to see where the regular lumber beam works. That's going to be the cheapest thing. We can walk into Home Depot and buy that wood. So unless there's not something available or it doesn't work for us, we're going to try to use the beam sizing guidelines. It met the beam criteria. There was just joists framing into the side of it, which is our criteria in that hierarchy, that they're all beams, even the joist is a beam, but the joist is a beam that's well, every 16 inches and doing a relatively simple job. So this, our actual beam, is the one that is picking up the beams that are doing the simple job, or tier two, if you will. <clears throat> so we saw that 2B01, there was four of them, and each one of them spanned four meters. So four meters divided by our sizing guideline of 14 gives us 286. Now we know 286 is bang on a two by 12 depth. So perfect, we've got a great depth here. Now, picking the width, do we use, and now maybe what if we had done this and our calculation came out at 270? and we were using a 286. Do we use the 270? Do we use the 286? Do we use 12 inches? What do we use? Meh. Like I said, the width sizing guidelines are very, very, very approximate. What I have done in your assignment is made sure that with all of those different options, whatever one you chose to use, there's still only one answer and they're all the same answer. So I, uh, I played with this question, or the equivalent question to this in your assignment, and went back and forth again and again and again to make sure that there was only one right answer, whether you used uh, the 286 or whether you used the 12 inches. Um, so I looked at that in depth. So with, or whether you use the two, or whether you use the three, again, that there's a huge range in there. So. W for our width is our 286 divided by 2 to 286 divided by 3, or 143 millimeters wide to 95 millimeters wide. Our 2 by 12s are 38 by 286. Um, three plies would be 114 by 286. Now, this one did not have just one answer here. You can see that we wanted something to be at least 95 millimeters wide and up to probably around 143. Again, we do not know the final answer for this width, but we wanna draw something that seems pretty reasonable. We know from the notes I gave you at the beginning there that two ply is a minimum. We don't just do one beam here. We screw at least two of them together, but 38 by 38 is 76. That's not even as big as the minimum that we suggested we draw. So I'm gonna go with a three ply here, knowing that the final design might be a four ply, but that's often not as big of an impact on the design. It could be if maybe this was in a wall, um, but often we have a soffit below the depth of this. So those are the things that, that's why sometimes this might be critical, but it tends not to be as critical. So I am using a three ply two by 12 beam. So you can see one, two, three. I've screwed three of these beams together. That's what this three means. So I have three two by 12s screwed together as a beam. So 2B02 was our longer beam here. Again, first we want to try first with regular lumber and see if it works. If regular lumber works, it's the cheapest. Let's use that. Except Already, I know that this 2x12 
was perfect for four meters. This is longer than that. I have a gut feel that this isn't gonna work in regular lumber. So let's go through it though. 5,330 divided by 14, which is our sizing guideline for regular lumber, gives us a 380. There is no regular lumber that's gonna work. So let's move on to engineered lumber. Maybe there's an engineered lumber material that works. D equals 5,330 divided by 16. That gives us 333 millimeters of PSL or LVL. They both came in a product that was 356 millimeters deep. So that's great. Now width, do we use 330? Do we use 356? Do we divide by two? Do we divide by three? Again, I'm going to make it easy for you on the assignment. It'll be pretty, it'll make, it'll work so that any of those options work. Um, in practice, this is just about drawing something reasonable. I'm going to use my 356 and I'm going to divide it by 3. And if you draw it, you'd see that it probably draws something that your eye goes, yeah, that looks right for what I expect to see there. So that calculates out 119. Well, 119, we could be using 354 or 345 by 356 plies of LVL or 2. 68 plies of 356 PSL. I can't remember if I give you anything with PSL or LVL on the assignment. If I do, it's not going to be as hard as this. Um, you have a template to fall back on here. I just I can't remember what I did in the assignment. Um, I only made it last week. Why I can't remember, I don't know. Um, but I've made six assignments because I've been trying to get ahead a little bit in the past two weeks. So I'm already, I'm already making assignments for lecture, lecture seven and eight. Um, so I forget what this question was on your assignment. But I'm pretty sure if I did have PSL or LVL on there, it was easier than this. If not, I wouldn't be looking for the width to be that critical. And if I was, I would have made it so that there was only one option available, i.e. a multiple choice. Um, now, 2BO3. Now, we know this is going to be a girder because there's a column above on it. It is doing above and beyond the normal job of just a beam. So we're going to make sure that we give ourselves lots of room for a big chonkers member to go in there. We want something with lots of space because we're going to have something heavily designed right there. So we saw that its span was 10 meters and 60 it was 10.67 meters or 10,670 millimeters. The sizing guideline for a girder was 12. That gives us 889 millimeters. There was no PSL or LVL available in that size. So we're looking at custom engineered glue lamb beam that is at least 889 millimeters deep. I didn't even give you a chart for glue lamb because glue lamb there are some outlines of sizes available in the, uh, the wood book. So I showed you the, the steel book. This is the wood book. Um, so again, like the steel book, only the very first little bit of it is the actual code. The code ends right about here, I believe. Um, and the rest is commentary and ability on, no, I was wrong, that's not the code. The code is the gray pages. The wood book puts it at the back. I was holding it backwards. I was, uh, so this is the code. All of this is interpretations of how to use the code and example problems. Um, so uh, again, in the glue lamb part, I'm not even giving you the, the glue lamb members. It's just enough to know that it would be a, a custom engineered glue lamb beam. Columns. Columns are always the interesting one because they're the least accurate. Now, they told us that the height was 2.438 meters tall. The sizing guideline for our columns is height divided by 30, or 82 millimeters. So that means we would want three 2x4s or a 4x4. Four four. Because remember, the minimum thickness or the minimum size 
needs to be at least 82 millimeters. So that means our 89s are perfect, but one ply of two by four isn't gonna be enough because it's only 38 millimeters wide. Two of them aren't gonna be enough because it's only 67 or 76 millimeters wide. Three of them are gonna be 114 millimeters wide, giving us both dimensions at least greater than 82 millimeters. Or our four by four post, which is 89 by 89. All of the columns, C1 to C5, are the same sizing guideline. That is not what the case would be for the full design. We could see the tributary areas for all of those columns were working at different levels of difficulty. So the final design would see a variety. Maybe we have some that are two plies of uh, two by four. Um, maybe we have up to four or five plies of two by fours. So let's move on to concrete now. So concrete um, uh, is a little bit more interesting because we make it on site, except for this first one that I'm going to show you. This is a precast hollow core slab. I've put it in the concrete sizing guidelines, but we tend to often use it in conjunction with steel. Um, as we're seeing CLT become more prevalent in the market, we might replace hollow core slabs with CLT, for example. Um, so uh, our hollow core is made in a plant um, uh, engineered by the fabricator. So similar to our open web steel joists um, uh, and, um, sorry, He, he had to get up and drive to Muskoka this morning for a site review. So he, he left the house at 4 a.m. this morning to drive to Muskoka and come back. Um, so I can only imagine that he's absolutely zonked. And he was, he was in conference calls with the graduate students until 6 p.m. last night doing um, uh, desk crits for them. So he's been, uh, he's been pushed to his limits. I, haven't, I basically haven't seen him in a, in a day. We've, we've texted each other. Uh, is mostly how we've communicated for the past little while. Okay, so precast hollow core slabs made by the manufacturer. Um, they have a beautiful finished bottom on them because they're made kind of in this kind of idealized world in a plant, weather controlled. Or most of our concrete, you know, it's just a it's just a person showing up in their truck, pouring it out of the back of their truck into. Uh, into some formwork. So, you know, the quality control levels are a little bit different there. Um, it comes in some standardized sizes, um, 150, 200, 250, 300, and 350 depths, but 200, 250, and 300 are the most common. Again, with metric versus imperial, some companies make their 200 to be 203, and some companies make their 8 inch to be 200. So you'll see published values for both, but the actual depth for different companies might be 203 or 200. So if that three millimeters is critical, you need to know what company you're talking about. So for precast hollow core slabs, uh, the sizing guideline is L divided by 40. So if our beams are at eight meters on center, so think of hollow core slab as super powered deck, if you will. So instead of being um, a deck on joists, we make it span a lot further. And now the thing that is picking up this hollow core, my fingers are now beams, not open web steel joists or purlins. They're spanning an extra distance. So hollow core can span a lot further than metal deck can. In fact, it usually takes the job of concrete on metal deck on open web steel joists or purlins and replaces it with one system. So now we're spanning all the way to our beams. So if the beams are at eight meters on center, the depth of the precast should be 8,000 divided by 40 or 200 millimeters. So 200 thick hollow core deck is what we'd be looking for here. 
Now, I told you the standard hollow core sizes, um, and I said that 200, 250, and 300 are the most common. So that means they tend to be economical if they're being used at their optimal length. So 200 hollow core slab is usually eight meters or less long. 250 hollow core slab is usually 10 meters or a little bit less long. This is the under, no, the undergrad class, this is the structures one less. Ooh, you got me fancy pair of mirrors to the deck. Curtains. Awesome. It was a, a grommet hole punch is how I messed up my finger because we're hanging outdoor curtains on our deck. Um, so I have this like system where I clip them and so the carabiners I bought were just a little bit sad, a little bit, a little bit flimsy. So he just got me some industrial carabiners. I'm very, I'm very happy about that. Uh, and so then a 300 hollow core slab is going to be 12 meters or a little bit less. If you get down to 10 meters, well, you'd probably switch to a 250. These are the optimal economical span lengths for these different hollow core slab options. Um, concrete sizing guidelines. Now, I always like to talk about one-way slab versus two-way slabs. I'm going to talk about a one-way slab here because you all tend to get it. This is the equivalent of a one-way slab. We made a little paper one-way slab. It can span in this direction, but it can't span in this direction, right? You get that. Well, in concrete, we put rebar in it, so it kind of technically can span in both directions. But how we support it leads us to understand if it's a one-way slab or a two-way slab. So we'll start with a one-way slab where we've only got beams kind of in one direction. And our sizing guideline is length divided by 18. So here's a beam and here's a beam. So we're saying that this is the length that it's spanning. That's our length. Darn it, it stopped again. Okay, so it did the funny little thing where it stopped recording again. Um, so you can see here that this is the length that we're talking about, and that's the depth now that we're talking about. Um, so this is similar to uh, the precast hollow core with the load going to two sides. It's being supported here, and it's being supported by here. Again, concrete is custom made. We set where our plywood is when we form it um, to make that depth but it's normal on construction documents to make it 50 millimeter increments. You could do something odd. I have done 165, I've done all kinds of odd dimensions, but that is not the norm. That is usually high-end custom, custom refined stuff. Um, so what I would be looking for from you would be 50 millimeter increments of things. So how deep does a one-way slab need to be if we're spanning four meters? Our sizing guideline is L divided by 18. So we have our four meters divided by 18 or 222. If we only put a 200 millimeter thick concrete slab on our drawings and we come to find out that we need a 250 slab in the design, final design later, we'd be pretty upset that we had lost that headroom. So this is telling us that we should go up a little bit. So we're gonna use a 250 cast in place concrete slab. Now, the most common cast in place slab depths we tend to make in Ontario is 200, 250, and 300 slabs. So what is the span length of the majority of the concrete slabs, one way slabs cast in Ontario? Well, a 200 slab spans about 3.6 meters. A 250 slab can span about 4.5 meters. And a 300 slab can span about 5.4 meters. Again, these are our preliminary sizing guidelines, so final design would rule it all. 
So that's our one-way span. Two-way spans are interesting because unlike our DAC and our hollow core that is very different in the two different directions, our, whole, our, concrete, on, our concrete, well, it's going to be hard to draw it, but imagine if we had a bit of a waffle in both directions, if you wanted to say it that way. We can literally span to both, all of the perimeter sides of this. But there are caveats on that. If you make two of the sides too far apart from each other, you literally just can't span to them. It's going to span in the other direction. So the guideline for that is a ratio of two to one. Now I don't want my screen to crap out on me. I'm gonna to try to draw it on the screen. I might have to stop this again and restart it. And if so, I'll just draw it on paper and show it to you. While I'm writing, I'm not gonna talk because that does seem to glitch it just a little bit more. And I can see that the sinking is funny when that happens. So you can see I've drawn two different slab profiles here. One of them is a square and one of them is a really long rectangle. I'm going to draw out the tributary areas for these sides of these rectangles of slab. You can see for the square slab, a quarter of each of the slab loads up each side. And it loads it up in a triangular shape. So the load distribution is not even along its length. There's a peak at the middle, and it's going to taper off to the edges. So now I'm going to draw that same idea on the rectangular slab. So you can see that for this bottom one, yeah, it's taken off a little bit of the load over here and a little bit of the load over here. But for the majority of this edge here, the majority of the load is going over here. So we wouldn't want to call this one a two-way slab because most of the load is going to this side and most of the load is going to this side, similar to a one-way slab. So the way we talk about this is a ratio of two to one of the sides. If you're smaller than two to one ratio, you can treat it like a two-way slab, as long as you design things on the perimeter to pick up those loads. So we still have to design what's picking up these loads here. Um, and if we do that, we can share this load out to all four sides. This one here, we don't just get to call it a two-way slab because it's not. The load, the majority of the load is going to go to this side and the majority of the load is going to go to this side. So for a two-way slab, um, typical sizes are still 200, 250, and 300, although we may cast a 150 or a 350 periodically or locally. So what I mean by that, if we have a project where 250 slab is what we're using everywhere. And one little bay has something unique happening to it. We don't want to switch what material we're using. So maybe we'll make one of those unusual slabs in that zone to meet that local criteria. So how deep does our two-way slab need to be if we're spanning eight meters? So we're talking about an eight by eight grid now. Well, our 8 meters divided by 30 
gives us 266. We could use a 300 cast in place concrete slab now. Again, 200, 250, and 300 slabs are the typical slab depth formed in Ontario. So how far can they span if we make sure they have supports at all the corners and we keep the ratio of those sides as not at all corners on all sides and keep the ratio less than two to one. Well, a 200 slab can now span six meters. A 250 slab can span 7.5 meters and a 300 slab can span nine meters. Most condos have a six meter grid. Most condos have a 200 slab and they get made again and again and again on each floor going up. Concrete beams. Concrete beams, um, we're gonna use a depth of L divided by 16, unless it's doing a little bit of a harder job. And then we're gonna do L divided by 12. So if it's a girder, we're gonna bump it up a little bit. We don't have purlins in this because our slab is doing the job of the deck and purlins or deck and joists or deck and open web steel joists combined into one thing. So now we just have the beams that are left. The cool thing about a beam is that it can be part of the slab. So we can bring the top of our concrete right up to be in line with the top of the slab. We'll just run our slab reinforcing through here. And so we gained a little bit of depth here by making, by designing it like this. What depth below slab do we need for a beam spanning 90 meters if the slab is 200 millimeters thick? Well, our size and guidelines it is 16 um, uh, is, is, is length divided by 16. So the depth is 9,000 divided by 16 or 562.5. We're gonna round up to 600. We like those 50 millimeter increments. So the beam projects 400 millimeters below the slab. D2 to D3, again, really crappy sizing guidelines. This is just to draw something visual. Um, I tend to stick more to the D divided by three side of the rules, but you're gonna see sometimes we'll draw wide, flat beams in concrete. Concrete is an interesting one where the sizing guidelines are slightly less helpful. Or, there's more room for variety when you do the final design, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so I'm going to use the D divided by three rules. So 600 divided by three, I'm going to get 200. So this beam projects 400 millimeters below the slab and is 200 millimeters wide. Or 200 by 600 cast in place beam cast with the 200 deep slab. So there's our 200 deep slab. There's our 200 by 600 concrete beam, but with only 400 millimeters projecting out below it. Concrete columns and concrete walls. So they're custom made on site. Again, typically 50 millimeter increments, but not required. We're gonna stick with 50 millimeter increments for what we're talking about. Walls wouldn't tend to be less than 200 unless it was very short and lightly loaded. Very rare to get anything less than 200 millimeters. Um, I've done it for very high-end feature things. You need flowable concrete, you need admixtures in it. Um, the, con the contractor needs to be aware of it. So it's, it's that unusual. So it's, we start with 200 and go up. What would the size of the columns and walls be for a building with a 4.2 meter story to story height or 4,200 millimeter story to story height? So our height is 4.2. Our rule of thumb is 20 for a column or 25 for the walls. So our columns would be need to be at least 210 millimeters thick. So 250 by 250 would be a pretty good starting spot. 
And our walls would need to be at least 168, and I said 200 meter thick, we wouldn't go less than that anyway. So for this building, our columns would probably want to be 250 by 250, and our walls would want to be 200. What if this was a 20 story building? Probably not a 250 by 250 column or a 200 millimeter wall. We'd probably have something much more substantial. You've probably all been in a concrete um, condo or uh, office building where those ground floor columns are huge, much bigger than eight inches by eight inches. So this is again where understanding context is a huge part of making use of the sizing guidelines. You have to be aware of what your overall greater context is. They didn't tell us much about this. Um, so maybe this is only a two story building and these sizing guidelines are gonna be really helpful for us. If it was something more than this, we'd wanna know to say, hey, expect something much bigger on your lower stories. On the upper stories, maybe these are really good choices. Look at that, past Shannon was just as smart as today's Shannon. What if the column was on the ground floor of a 45 story building? All right, masonry. We're not really gonna do much with masonry, but sizing, or um, it tends to show up a lot on projects. Um, uh, it tends to be ubiquitous on certain types of building structures, which I talked about um, over the past two weeks for you. Uh, it's very popular for non-load-bearing partitions as well. It comes in 190, 240, and 290 widths. 190 is the most common. If we're talking about brick, we'd be having more than one wife. We're talking about walls, for example. Veneer is a separate thing. I'm going to show that in a slide in a minute. Load-bearing versus non-load-bearing. What does that mean? Well, load-bearing means that we're supporting something. We've got load coming down on it. Non-load-bearing, well, we don't have as much that it's doing. It's mostly just holding up its own weight. But we don't want it to tip over. We also don't want it to turn into a load-bearing wall and catch us by surprise because then it's not going to be strong enough for what it's trying to do. So load-bearing, do I have it in here? No. The tops of load-bearing or non-load-bearing partitions look like this. And let's see if I can make it work without... And it stopped. So I'll pause this and start it up again. Okay, so the non load bearing partition needs to be restrained at the top, and most walls get restrained at the top by the thing they're supporting. So they all work together and stop itself from tipping over. They're getting back to the lateral load resisting system somewhere. But a non load bearing partition needs something to stop it at the top, and it's not picking up whatever the load is up above. So, but we don't want it to start picking up the load. So what we tend to do is, there's a few different details and a few different ways we can do it, but this is one of them, where we provide little clip angles. We keep the top of the wall back a little bit. We, maybe we need to fill this with some sort of non-compressible foam if there's a fire rating issue between these two sides. And then we put some vertically slotted holes in this. So the roof can go up and down, or the floor above can go up and down without actually loading this wall up. But it's there to brace the wall from tipping over. Now in, your, um, in the uploads I gave you, there's a bunch of typical details. Again, it's not part of what this course is. These are just the things I like to tell you when I have the opportunity because no one else is going to tell them to you and when you start working you're going to be expected to know some of these things. Even though it's not in our curriculum to teach it to you, I want to make sure you hear these things. So as part of that, it's one of the reasons why I gave you guys all the typical details. And in those typical details in the, um, in the PDF section of uh, the modules, there is a typical detail for laterally braced non-loaded non-load bearing partitions and you will see a detail and a few others that look something like this. 
So what would be the size of walls and partitions for a building with that same 4.2 meter story to story height? Well, the walls would be uh, 4.2 divided by 20 or 210. The block that's available is 240 block then. The partitions would be our 2.4 meters divided by 36 or 117 millimeters, meaning we'd need 190 block. Remember in the concrete version, we would probably have everything load bearing and it all needed to be 200 thick walls. Here, the designation of load bearing and non-load bearing becomes really important and all of our load bearing block would be 240 thick, so bigger than what we had in our concrete version of it. Veneer here is just, I'm not even going to do any sizing guidelines, I just wanted to give you some tips because this tends to be a thing that gets drawn wrong. Um, you can go up to level, uh, up to 11 meters if you start at grade, but often we have shelf angles at each story. The brick veneer is laterally connected back to the building every 600 millimeters. So laterally, it gets tied back all over the place. Gravity loads, it can go up to 11 meters for the very first run. Um, but if you have more than that, you want to do story to story. So we often do story to story. And we often have to do that at, um, at window openings as well. So you'll have some sort of steel angle that's connected to your building that the leg sticks out and picks up the block. Dare I try it again? worked. So you can see this is our veneer, this is our building back here, and this is somewhere near our story level where we have our, our brick veneer out here. Normally there's an air gap here. This dimension in between those two things is getting bigger and bigger all the time as we change our, uh, our building codes and our envelope requirements and try to get closer and closer to net zero. Um, so you'll find a variety of these details. We often also worry about cold bridging between this steel veneer and whatever is picking it up. So, you know, um, part of your building science um, requirements are going to be talking and looking about these sort of things. Um, and engineers are always, it feels like every project I do, this gets reinvented again, time and time again. So sizing guidelines with cantilevers. What do you do when it's a cantilever? Well, let's look at this one thing here with a backspan and a cantilever. I'm going to write that right on here on slide 53. Backspan and cantilever. Um, and let's take a look at what it means if it's a steel beam, a steel girder, a concrete beam, or a concrete slab. Basically, you take the rule of thumb and you cut it in half, similar to what we do with our deflection criteria. So, steel beam, girder, concrete beam, slab sizing guidelines for 8 meters, 400 thick or 400 deep beam, uh, a girder would be 533, a slab would be 500, and a slab would be 445. Our cantilever, we get to use half of all of those criteria. So, if the length is half of the backspan, we're going to get the same sizing guidelines. Now remember, these dimensions might not be related to each other like that. So if this is one continuous member, the worst of these two things is going to govern. Just something to think about here. So your tips going forward, forever and ever and ever tips, the sizing guidelines are always going to help you with your preliminary sizing. That is going to be a thing that you are going to do again and again and again and again throughout your career. Um, you should understand though that those rules are not perfect and you should understand what your constraints are. So, you know, if you've got joists at 24 inches on center, maybe your plywood being three quarters inch isn't applicable anymore. Um, and maybe the sizing guidelines for the length of those joists don't apply the same way. So understanding when things aren't normal is part of the ability of using the sizing guidelines. 
So, for studying and for the project, same as above. I said memorize the sizing guidelines. Listen, I haven't even memorized them. I look them up all the time, again and again and again and again. But I often also have a better feel before I even need the sizing guidelines of what's an appropriate thing to draw in there. So you should know them really well or have them called up on your phone. When I do studio crits, I call up the sizing guidelines and have it sitting there open as a saved as thing in my Dropbox because I know I am going to get asked 10 times throughout the day, how deep does it need to be? And I say, let's look at the sizing guidelines and I pull it out and we look at it using the sizing guidelines. So you guys are going to want to be able to do that as well. You can print these off, sleep with them under your pillow, have them framed on your desk. And when you retire at 80, because let's face it, you're going into architecture, uh, you'll have it um, still framed on your desk and you can take it home and uh, put it on your retiree desk now. So they're very important. You're going to find that other, other um, people in the industry might have ones that are slightly different. They're going to be pretty darn close though. You might find different ones on the internet. You're using my sizing guidelines because my answers for the assignment are set up to it. But if you did find something on the internet, they're going to be pretty darn close to these sizing guidelines. So let's just stick with these for now. And then you can go out and use someone else's if you like theirs better. But they're going to be very, very, very close. Okay, guys, next week we start digging in to the actual loading of things. We're going to start doing real calculations on our buildings. So see you, not next week. Next week is uh, spring break. So we'll see you the week after.